Good morning, everybody. Welcome to PCH Grand Rounds. We have a very special presentation this morning. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Terry Greeby, who is a longtime geneticist and researcher in the Phoenix area. Dr. Greeby was trained in her pediatric residency and did a chief residency here in Phoenix back when it was called the Phoenix Hospitals Affiliated Pediatric Program. It's basically the predecessor of the current uh, program today. Um, and uh, she's been really in the Tucson or Phoenix area ever since. The topic today uh, is on uh, 22Q deletion syndrome, or DeGeorge syndrome. She is the medical director of this clinic at uh, Phoenix Children's. And we will have a special patient presentation as well uh, from Mandy McCabe. Dr. Greeby will introduce her at the uh, proper time, but we're excited to have a patient uh, to present this morning. Just a little bit of brief history. When Grand Rounds was conceived about a century ago by Dr. Osler at Johns Hopkins, it was not uh, traditionally a lecture as it has been turned into today across the country. Uh, Grand Rounds was conceived really as a patient presentation. Uh, and uh, we like to have patients in Grand Rounds as much as possible. There are some you know, obstacles in this day and age that prevent that from happening too often, but when we get a chance, we, we always like to do it. So we're extremely thankful that Dr. Greeby was uh, uh, willing to participate with this format and very thankful to Mandy uh, for participating as well. So without further ado, I'll uh, bring up Dr. Greeby. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Michael Olson for inviting me to speak to you today about a condition that I've had the great opportunity to be more involved with over the last five years, as he mentioned, as director of our 22Q Medical Clinic. Um, I've not only learned a lot about uh, the diagnosis and treatment of 22Q, but I've also had the, the wonderful opportunity to meet um, a fabulous community of patients and families. Um, this morning, I'd like to share with you our current knowledge about the diagnosis and treatment of 22Q and uh, several patient stories, as you've heard, that reflect the broad spectrum of uh, variability of presentation of 22Q. I have a lot to say, in it, and so I might speak fast and skip a few slides because I can never seem to keep within time, so I apologize up front for that. Um, my educational objectives for today are for you to recognize the common presenting signs and symptoms of 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which we affectionately call 22Q to utilize the correct genetic testing for the diagnosis of 22Q, and finally, to provide the appropriate evaluations and referrals for a patient with 22Q. Uh, to open our presentation this morning, I'd like to introduce a, a friend of mine, someone I've had the honor of knowing for the past three years. Not only is she raising three active boys, but as she is also uh, coping with, and I have to say conquering, many medical problems related to 22Q. Um, she's graciously agreed to tell us her life story, so I'd like to welcome up uh, Mandy McCabe. Please help me welcome her. Thank you for letting me come here and tell you my story. My name is Mandy McCabe, and this is a look into my life as a 22Q warrior and mother. My heart is made of strength, courage, and love. My children are full of energy, loving, funny, and my motivation. I will be strong when faced with adversity and pain. I am a 22Q warrior. I am a single mother of three boys, Caden, uh, General, and Christopher. In the beginning, I was diagnosed at 27 years old. Um, after my son Christopher was born, they, he was born with a vascular ring, and at Sunrise, uh, Sunrise Children's Hospital up in Vegas, they decided to do testing on him, and they found that he had 22Q deletion. At that time, they decided to test me and my husband at the time. They found that not only did Christopher and I have 22Q, but they also decided to test my children, and they found that General had 22Q deletion also. Caden had not 20, had no 22Q signs. However, General and Caden and, and myself not only 
we also have uh, chromosome six duplication. And throughout my life, my parents always wondered what was next with me. Once I was diagnosed at, 22, at 27 years old, all my life ex health experiences between schooling comprehension issues, behavioral and health conditions, heart conditions, um, teeth problems, hearing problems, neck problems, feet problems, language impairment, uh, and swallowing issues, they finally had an answer to the reason why all this was happening. Before then, I had never been tested. Nobody even thought to even test for anything. I attended the 22Q clinic in January 2015 and again in March of 2016. Through the clinic, I have been introduced to specialized doctors who understand and work with adult 22Q. These amazing doctors have been able to since diagnose me with the following conditions. I've been diagnosed with fetal pharyngeal insufficiency. I had my pharyngeal flat placement in March of this year. I had not only one uh, neck fusion that I, that I knew about, but I actually had two neck natural fusions. I also had a bulging disc, which I just had surgery last uh, Monday for. They replaced it with a artificial disc finally. I also um, went from having auto, was it otosclerosis, was the hearing loss that I've known since I was, I'm 31 now, so I thought it was when I was junior high, so I thought I had otosclerosis. They told me the only way to diagnose that is, for sure, is to either go through surgery or, you know, just kind of play it by ear. Well, as of March of 2006, I finally got diagnosed with sensory hearing loss. Something that I probably should have been diagnosed way back when I was younger. I've also been diagnosed with the B12 deficiency that since has been led to pernicious anemia because that also was left untreated and despite me asking for, you know, B12 um, levels to be checked, they still, nobody in my area would do it. So now I have to take weekly B12 shots due to that. My son Christopher, who is now four years old, he was diagnosed at two weeks old. He was diagnosed at about five or six months in utero with a vascular ring. He also ended up having a second surgery for um, a litigation of the thoracic duct. He also about, I think two years ago, he had another vascular ring surgery. He has veal pharyngeal insufficiency. He had his pharyngeal flat placement in March of 2016. He was then also determined to have a submucous cleft palate, which we knew nothing of the, the, that was even present. He has developed a speech impairment. He uses an iPad for communication now. He has behavioral issues, immune deficiencies, recurrent respiratory illness, and uh, mild sensory processing disorder. Since coming to the clinic, we actually have received one of the 3D hearts, and I can tell you this has been a game changer for us. Without this, nobody knew exactly what was his heart condition. It was the hardest thing for us to explain. And now with this, we were actually able to, to finally figure out what was going on and be able to tell him. Um, because when he had his first surgery, he actually, we did not know about this double ring. His doctor told us we only had the main one. So since then, they found the double ring and they were able to fully repair it. He has done pretty well so far. My son, General, he is now six years old. He was diagnosed at two and a half years old. He has recurrent asthma, hearing loss, which we still don't know what exactly is going on with that. He has both plays, behavioral issues, um, eating issues, gastro issues, sensory issues, um, immune issues where him and actually Christopher had to have shots for that. Um, General and Christopher both attend weekly OT therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy. My son Kaden was diagnosed with the chromosome of six, which his um, diagnosis lead, led to ADHD, sensory anxiety, and he is um, now homeschooled. And he also attends bi-weekly occupational therapy for his sensory issues. Since my children and I have attended the 22Q clinics, our world has changed. No longer am I wondering what's next. My children and I get the help that we needed. Our conditions have been diagnosed. We see doctors who know and specialize in 22Q syndrome. That alone for us is 
a huge deal because nobody in our area up in Bullet City where we come from really know anything. A lot of my stuff should have been diagnosed way back then, not waiting until I'm around my 30s. Um, we do travel four hours down here two to three times a month. Sometimes we typically will travel up to four times a month, um, but I can tell you it's worth it. I would not change it for anything. If I am able to educate doctors up there, it'd be a lot easier, but you know, no one, it's not as well known up there. Um, the clinic has helped to prepare us in what to expect, whom to talk to, and what specialists to see in the future. That is alone is a big deal because my children have now all the opportunities in the world. When, this is a quote of mine that I kind of follow by a little bit and something that if you run into any 22 patients or any patients alone or for yourself, um, when life hands you a challenge, don't take it as a curse. Instead, look at it as an opportunity, an opportunity to learn, grow, or make a change. Face each day and challenge as it comes. Look for the little things that make you smile. Embrace the challenges and be strong and ready for the next challenge. Nothing is impossible or unachievable. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. I'm continually inspired by your strength, your determination, your energy, and most recently your PowerPoint and public speaking skills. <laughs> so, I think I'll have to hire you. Let's, let's go. Okay, give me a second here. Okay. Okay. Okay, I wanted to just very quickly share with you a few other patient stories uh, that um, are a bit different from Mandy's, but show, again, just how variable this condition can be. Um, this is a little uh, patient, I'm not going to read everything, but uh, well, she wasn't diagnosed with 22Q until age five years. She'd been followed for several years with chronic ear infections, had PE tubes and speech therapy. Her speech was noted to be hypernasal, and then she developed nasopharyngeal reflux. It wasn't until a second ENT was consulted that they realized that she uh, had a gap in her palate consistent with uh, velopharyngeal insufficiency. So she was referred to Dr. Singh, our plastic surgeon, and she recognized the association with 22Q and made that diagnosis. Um, this little girl is, um, had early, no early development that was appropriate, but really has now lagged behind and developed some learning issues, but no cardiac issues. Um, another little patient was referred uh, to uh, us in another uh, multidisciplinary clinic that I I'm thrilled to participate in with uh, Harper Price. This is our congenital and genetic skin disease clinic. Uh, this little girl was referred to us at 16 months of age by her pediatrician for hypopigmentation of her, of her skin and, um, and thinning of her hair. Um, her history was significant for chronic infections that I've listed here, sinus infections, ear infections, pneumonia, chronic asthma, and recurrent fevers. Um, when we saw her in clinic, she'd already had a pretty extensive workup with uh, many normal immune uh, studies, but did have um, a low uh, lymphocyte panel, low CD8, uh, and low natural killer cells, and a skewed CD4 count. Um, the dermatology team determined that she really didn't have evidence of abnormal pigmentation, but she did have this fine hair that pulled out easily that I've learned now is called loose antigen hair. Uh, which is a nonspecific finding, um, but I recognize that she had symptoms of 22Q, and indeed she also has a deletion, uh, but not the typical presentation. And then the third patient I wanted to mention is came to our adult clinic at the age of 28. Um, he had a history of uh, seizures that started in early adulthood and had been treated for seven years with uh, Depakote and remained seizure-free. Um, then the neurologist tried to wean him off his seizure medication and his seizures recurred. Uh, at that time, somebody quite astute looked through his basic labs and said, oh, he has a low calcium level. And looking back seven years prior, he'd had low calcium at that time as well, but it really had been kind of overlooked. Um, he was referred to an endocrinologist who diagnosed him with hypoparathyroidism. Um, he was then referred to a second endocrinologist who recognized an association, performed a genetic test, and lo and behold, he also has 22Q, not diagnosed throughout life. Um, he had mild autism, but was functional. He has a job. He's a wonderful young man. Um, came to us uh, for evaluation and, and requesting some treatment for anxiety. So there you have kind of four uh, very different stories, but all representing 
the same condition, 22Q. So what is 22Q syndrome? Well, many of you, as Dr. Olson uh, mentioned earlier, know it as DeGeorge syndrome. Um, Angelo DeGeorge was uh, an Italian-American uh, endocrinologist in Philadelphia at Temple University who was really the first in the mid-60s to recognize this combination of hypoparathyroidism, thymic insufficiency uh, with cellular uh, immunodeficiency as well. And he recognized that combination often existed in combination or in, in conjunction with other malformations, often of the third and fourth uh, branchial pouches in this region of the developing embryo. Um, and it was quickly coined George syndrome. Um, quite separately, uh, later uh, in the 1970s, this is Angelo DeGeorge, uh, and here is Dr. Robert Sprinson, who separately, as a speech pathologist, saw in a subset of his patients many who had hypernasal voices, cleft palate, uh, and uh, some facial changes. Uh, and that was later, of course, called Sprinson syndrome, um, also known as velocardiofacial syndrome. Um, and then uh, over the following uh, decades, several other conditions were separately described by other geneticists with similar overlapping features, something called conotruncal anomaly phase syndrome, um, autosomal dominant Opitz syndrome, John Opitz, geneticist at University of Utah, and in Eastern Europe, a condition called Sedlakova syndrome. Well, it wasn't until about 1992 when our genetic technology caught up in the um, technique called FISH or fluorescence in situ hybridization was developed that we realized that all of these conditions are one and the same, 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, or 22Q for short. So how common is it? Well, it turns out it's much more common than we thought, and even you know, when I began my training, we thought of it as a pretty rare condition, but um, having our genetic test really helps us to identify those milder cases. Um, right now, the statistics are showing about 1 in 4,000 to 1 in 6,000, and in the 22 community, it's really felt to be maybe even 1 in 2,000. Um, because of the variable expression that I mentioned, these different phenotypes, it's probably much uh, more uh, frequent than we, we realize. And as Mandy's story, story tells us, you know, we have many undiagnosed adults that, uh, you know, haven't uh, had testing or haven't had the opportunity to be tested. Um, one study by Donna McGinn at CHOP um, looking at 30,000 lab specimens found one in 100 with a 22Q deletion. So that's pretty amazing. So overall, it is the most common microdeletion syndrome in the general population. Um, now that we have our uh, microarray testing that you've probably heard about, we're finding some patients with smaller, what we call nested deletions, who have milder symptoms. So um, again, they may not be um, diagnosed. So what are the cardinal features of 22Q? I'm going to just talk about them uh, briefly and then go into detail about each one. Congenital heart defects. So that is really the, the most common presenting feature, um, often in the newborn period and sometimes prenatally now with our fetal heart program. Cleft palate or palate dysfunction, the second main presenting feature. And often this presents um, with feeding issues in the newborn period and can be overlooked. So I, just make my little plug for when you do your newborn exam, open that baby's mouth, don't just stick your finger in, use your light and really look because a lot of these children have clefts of the posterior soft palate and those are often missed until they come back to you at four to six weeks of age and now they're having nasopharyngeal reflux. They are failure to thrive, they're not gaining birth weight, moms are frustrated. Um, so that's an easy thing to miss. Um, not all of them have you know, the full bony cleft palate. Um, immunodeficiency. Um, this is, uh, was, you know, a cardinal sign in the past, and it has various components that I'll explain later. Endocrine abnormalities, classically hypocalcemia, but also uh, several other um, hormone imbalances that I'll mention. Craniofacial features, they do vary, but there are some classic ones that I'll mention. It's kind of a subtle gestalt, but uh, over time, we've come to recognize a lot of patients that way. Um, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, definitely some developmental delay in most of the individuals, but that does vary. And finally, and you know, most um, tragically, I think for the families are, are the high risk of psychiatric disorders and, uh, later in life, and I'll talk about those. Okay, so first, how does congenital heart disease manifest in our patients? Um, there are, it's very common, 75%, and um, 
Steve Pofall, my colleague from cardiology, will say if we look hard enough, we're going to find something. So it isn't only cardiac, but also a lot of vascular anomalies that occur. Um, it is the major cause of, of mortality. Um, luckily, with our advances, you know, our patients are doing quite well. But in the newborn period, that is um, a major concern. Um, it is the most common presenting feature, as I said, and uh, often diagnosed prenatally. If you had to pick a type or category of heart defects, the vast majority are conotruncal left-sided outflow tract anomalies, and I'll list uh, the most common ones. Um, patients who in the past were diagnosed with velocardiofacial or Sprenson syndrome often had just VSD, so milder heart defects, and some of them uh, had heart murmurs that resolved and may have never have even seen a cardiologist. Um, like I said, they had heart murmurs. Okay, so what are the frequencies of heart defects? Um, by far, the most common is tetralogy of flow in about 20% of patients. And again, these may not always be picked up in the newborn period. I think Mandy said not right away. Yeah, you were two days old, okay. And, but some of our patients may be a bit later. Um, interrupted aortic arch is a classic uh, for 22Q. So these patients may do well in the newborn period and then maybe at 24, 48 hours of age suddenly crash when the ductus closes and appear septic. Uh, so that is a common problem. Uh, about 14% have VSDs, which are much milder. And truncus arteriosus in about 6%. I want to mention vascular ring because that is, you know, can be considered a vascular anomaly, um, but can impinge on the posterior esophagus and be a common cause of feeding issues in these children, causing vomiting, reflux, swallowing difficulties. Um, and as Mandy mentioned with her son, he had one diagnosed later and he had surgery and still was having swallowing difficulties and we found a second one. So these are often difficult to pick up. You're not necessarily going to see them on echo. You might need a CT angiogram. To, to find them. Um, and I'll just mention these other anomalies less common. Um, about 24% have no cardiac defects. Uh, and then vascular anomalies are not uncommon. We have a lot of children with aberrant subclavian arteries and some with absent pulmonary arteries, which uh, is a very severe form associated with tetralogy of flow. And various patients over the years with a missing carotid artery or vertebral artery. What about speech issues and palate problems? As I mentioned, these are quite common. Um, they may be immediately diagnosable at birth, but they may be um, things that present late with simple speech issues. Um, but nasopharyngeal uh, reflux or vomiting through the nose is a key feature that should clue us into the possibility of a cleft palate. Um, overall, these occur in over two-thirds of our patients. Um, and I've just listed here in your handout kind of the breakdown of what percent have complete cleft palate. And as you can see, it's not the majority. So we have to have a very high suspicion. Um, velopharyngeal insufficiency, I'll, I'll show you a diagram of that. But that may manifest solely as hypernasal speech and sometimes not picked up till much later. Um, I'm just in the diagrams here, I'm showing you various degrees of cleft palate. So about 11% have the complete cleft of the bony and the soft palate. Whereas here you see this one's a little more posterior, this one quite posterior with kind of a submucous cleft there. Um, if you have a child with a bifid uvula like this or, or a median raphan uvula, that again should alert you to the possibility of palatal dysfunction and they should be referred to our colleagues um, in plastic surgery. So about 5% have the bifid uvula. Cleft lip, we see occasionally, but it's really a separate condition and not, doesn't make me think of 22Q, mostly just uh, patients with cleft palate. And then VPI, as I mentioned, quite common. Um, this diagram I, I included to just show you what VPI is, because it's something uh, I wasn't even familiar with early in my career. Um, this shows you kind of what we call the open port, so at rest, when we breathe in, air goes through the nasal cavity and down the posterior pharynx. Um, and the soft palate is relaxed. Um, normally when we speak, our soft palate closes here, what they're calling the closed port. So that forces air from your trachea through your vocal cords and out your mouth. Air should not be coming through the nose. But for patients with VPI, that posterior palate closure doesn't occur adequately. So air is escaping through the nose, giving them that nasal quality that, that we see. And this does require a surgery. So many of our patients have an initial cleft palate repair when they're about 8 to 10 or 10 to 12 months of age. 
but then if they have VPI, this may not become apparent until they're a little older, and they'll often need a second surgery uh, when they're four to six years of age. Okay, immunodeficiencies is another one of the classic features that we see, and this does vary, but overall, three-fourths of our patients have some form of immunodeficiency. Um, in a very small subset, they can have overwhelming issues at birth with sepsis, but most of them have what the immunologists sometimes call partial de George, where they have some immune function, uh, but, but their T cells are low. So typically, uh, this is due to thymic hypoplasia. Sometimes the cardiothoracic surgeons will tell us at surgery we didn't see a thymus. Uh, that's a big clue. Um, but we still do check this in the newborn period. Every child with 22Q should get T uh, lymphocyte subsets uh, to look at their T cells. Um, the good news is it does improve over time. Um, but we, we do know that they still have problems later in life. Um, we also check immunoglobulins because about a quarter have um, humoral deficiencies. I've seen some low IgG, IgM, IgA deficiency pretty common. And some of them have impaired response to pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccines. So if we're seeing immune deficiencies um, of any sort, um, we, I confer with our immunologist and sometimes we recommend holding off on live virus vaccines in the first year of life until we repeat their numbers closer to one year, see how they're doing. Um, a lot of the children do have repeated infections that I mentioned earlier, and this is typically respiratory, upper respiratory, and is, can be related to the dysphagia. So aspiration pneumonia, uh, palate dysfunction leads to chronic ear infections, sinus infections. Um, the good news is, as I said, they get better with age, but more recent research is showing that even our older children and adults are a little more susceptible to infections throughout life. What about endocrine abnormalities? So I mentioned hypocalcemia is a cardinal feature, anywhere from 17 to 60 percent. Um, we're seeing um, variable um, levels, um, occasionally presenting as seizures. Um, this is due to hypoparathyroidism, so we get an intact PTH level on our patients. Um, it usually, again, normalizes with age, but what we are seeing is that it can recur um, with illness or physical stress, such as fever, surgery, and other illnesses. We just actually admitted a patient over the weekend with 22Q who came into the ED here with a high fever. She had a UTI, um, and we uh, have our patients, we have what I call my emergency calcium letter. That was given to the ED physician who did an ionized calcium, and it was low and we did a total calcium was also low. So uh, I felt we should admit her because she also had low T cells. And did normalize, we were able to give her oral supplementation, but um, our goal is definitely to prevent seizures. And some other deficiencies we see, we see hypothyroidism in a subset of our patients, so we monitor that annually. Uh, and about five, um, I'm sorry, about 40% of our children um, remain below the fifth percentile for growth. I've seen most of our patients have normal birth weights. I've seen many in the five uh, to six pound uh, range at birth. Their growth tends to be slow in the first years of life, and we actually have specific 22Q growth charts that we can provide you with that you should plot their growth. Um, actual growth um, hormone deficiency is rare, but we do have a few patients in our cohort um, with that. So what are the classic facial features that we see? Um, there are some described, but as I said, they are somewhat subtle. Um, the eyes are described as being somewhat narrow, then palpebral fissures like you see in this girl. Sometimes the eyelids are a bit hooded, and sometimes they have widely spaced eyes. Ears tend to be fairly normal but small, and a, a small percent of patients will have um, preauricular uh, tags or pits. Uh, there's a classic nasal configuration we see called a pear-shaped nose. I think this girl has it. Um, more striking than the other girl, but kind of broader at the top, narrow at the bottom, sometimes with small nasal ala. And the other one we see is some of our patients have this cute little dimple in their nasal tip. Um, over time, many of them develop more of an elongated face with kind of high cheekbones like you see in this girl, um, but again, not everyone. Uh, short philtrum and a thin upper lip. And then, for some reason, a lot of our kids have these very long slender fingers. But I do want to say that not everyone has these facial features, and I always tell parents, your child looks mostly like you, and that is definitely true. Um, feeding issues are a very uh, big problem in the newborn period, and I can't stress this enough. Uh, a third of our patients have these, and it's, it's really due to um, 
a multitude of, of different potential issues. I mentioned cleft palate, but a lot of the children have a discoordinated swallow with dysphagia, um, putting them at risk for aspiration. Some of them have abnormal uh, cricopharyngeal musculature. So we really pay uh, close attention to this. Um, a number of our patients do have to go on and have NG tubes and intense feeding therapy. Um, the good news is that they get through this, but that first year of life is, is quite a critical period. Um, constipation is something we also see um, later on in some of the patients, and so we, we treat that as well because that can lead to more um, GI is, uh, distress, uh, poor feeding, and reflux. So the next few slides I'm just going to go through very quickly because there is a multitude of medical problems that we can see in 22Q. One of the articles that was published probably 10 years ago listed over 240 different medical problems associated with 22Q. But I just wanted to mention a few that we do see more commonly. Um, so in ENT, we, we see chronic serosotitis media likely related to fluid uh, from the palate dysfunction, and that can lead to conductive hearing loss. Uh, asymmetric crying faces you've heard of due to a, uh, absence of the depressor angularis oris muscle that um, has been linked to 22Q as well. Um, I mentioned vascular ring. We have a high suspicion for that. Some of the children have tracheomalacia that improves over time. About a third of patients have renal anomalies, and I've kind of highlighted some of the more common ones here. So one of the things we get at the time of diagnosis is, is a renal ultrasound on all of our kids. Um, and cervical spine anomalies are, are quite common, and, and luckily it's most often just C2, C3 fusion. Uh, but as in, in Mandy's experience, you know, we have some patients who have more serious C-spine anomalies of C1 and C2 in complete development of the C1 ring. Um, and we've had a couple of patients with that recently in our, ch in our children. Luckily, the, the spinal cord, uh, the C-spine seems to be stable in these children, but long-term studies are now showing that some of our adults are, are experiencing complications later in life. So uh, one more reason that early diagnosis is helpful. I have to mention autoimmune diseases because these are much more common in 22Q, and two of them in particular that we're seeing are JRA in a subset of our patients. So we take those complaints of uh, joint pain very seriously and refer them to, to rheumatology, and thrombocytopenia. So some patients develop autoantibodies against their platelets. Um, I'm seeing more and more of our patients, maybe up to a third, are running platelet counts, about 100,000. Um, you know, not in a dangerous range, but certainly something we need to monitor if they're going to need surgery. Um, we've had a few who've had frank bleeding and have had been to be admitted. Um, and these are things that aren't necessarily present in the newborn period, but things that we monitor throughout their life. Um, we send everyone to the ophthalmologist because eye problems are more common, basically in all conditions. And a, a subset have structural GI anomalies, um, but I want to stress these are not common. I'm just going to breeze through this slide, but the most common CNS abnormality we see in these children is really developmental delay, and that's something with early diagnosis and we can address and send for early therapies. Um, seizures are not common, luckily, but we do see them, as I said, if the patient has hypocalcemia. So I'll just move on to the next. Um, so how do our children with 22Q develop? I've listed some studies here. I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but just to say there are mild delays, but not typically severe delays. And there are mild delays in motor development, mean age of walking 18 months, um, but really the most severe delays are in language. And a lot of patients have been um, described as nonverbal at two to three years of age. But when we bring them to clinic, our speech pathologist will commonly say, you know what, this child is talking. He's babbling away, he's having a whole conversation with us, but we just can't understand the thing he's saying. And that's because of the palate issues. So it's not so much receptive language, but expressive language. And if we address that with the proper speech therapy and palate surgery, we're making a big difference for these children. Um, but I've listed a couple studies, and you can see that the, the IQ scores for many of the children are averaging in the borderline range, um, you know, about 78. So they are struggling with uh, um, keeping up with their peers, but, um, but really responding well to early intervention. Um, again, the school age study showed a mean IQ of 76, but we are seeing some split between verbal and performance IQ, so some specific areas of learning disability. Um, many of our adults are still struggling. Um, they do have some uh, nonverbal learning disabilities, but do have some strengths that I've mentioned here um, in memory, uh, learning, 
uh, decoding and spelling, but some other um, deficits that really uh, cause some struggles for them throughout life. But a lot of our patients, our adult patients, are working, um, some full-time, many working part-time and still relying on some support from family. I think probably the hardest thing that our families with 22Q face is that after they've gone through all these heart surgeries, palate surgeries, and they've recovered from some serious medical issues, now they still have this specter of mental illness looming before them. Um, there's a significant um, risk of uh, mental health issues throughout life for individuals with 22Q. Um, it does change with age. So in the, the young children, we're seeing ADHD to be quite common, as we see across the board in our population. A lot of our kids have significant anxiety, and this is something parents tell us about all the time. Just fearful in new situations, fearful uh, at school, and, and that can be quite debilitating, and that's something that can persist uh, in adulthood. And about 20% have autism, so always keep that in mind. Um, but social, social interaction is really challenging for our individuals with 22Q. Um, but by adulthood, over 60% of our patients have some type of psychiatric disorder, anxiety being the most common, often accompanied by depression. But there is a 20 to 25% risk of schizophrenia, which is the thing our parents fear the most. Um, unfortunately, right now, our genetic testing doesn't allow us to determine who is going to develop schizophrenia and who isn't. So there's a lot of research going on in that area, but we still can't tell them reliably. So that's, that's hard. So what is the genetic basis of 22Q? Well, as you know, it's due to a deletion on the long arm of 22Q in the Q11.22 region. Um, the typical size is 2.55 to 3 megabases or million base pairs, and what that means is that it encompasses about 40 to 60 different genes. Um, this deletion size is, is the classic size, and most patients have the same size deletion, which is interesting because the phenotype that I've shared with you can vary so considerably um, from patient to patient. Most cases are de novo, meaning that your patient is the first in the family, and only about 10% are inherited. Um, less than 1% have what we call a translocation, um, meaning that they have a chromosome rearrangement between two chromosomes, so we don't usually need to be as concerned about that. But the mechanism, and I've, I've put a, a, a diagram in your handout about this, is called non-allelic homologous recombination. So what does that mean? Um, there are segmental duplications of repeated segments of DNA that um, flank the region, and I'll show you that here. So we have four regions here. These represent two copies of chromosome 22, and these are the four regions that have been designated A, B, C, and D, and they have repeated patterns of uh, the C, T, A, and G uh, nucleotides. And whenever you have areas of repeated patterns, you have this propensity for the chromosomes to misalign. Instead of lining up perfectly during meiosis, they might overlap and not line up perfectly. And that's what you see here. The most common um, overlap is the A to D area. And when that happens, you have a propensity toward what we call crossing over. So that one chromosome has crossed over here and the other here. And now you have two unequal chromosomes. This chromosome A now has a duplication of 22Q with the extra region, and this one has deletion. So when we talk about 22Q, we're talking about the deletion that's missing the B, C, and D region and part of A and D, but there are patients who have micro-duplication 22Q. So you might do a, a test and see that as well. That's a separate condition, um, but it does exist and tends to be a lot milder, and those patients often have either no symptoms or mild developmental delay and not always um, congenital anomalies. So what testing do you want to do? Um, I guess that depends, unfortunately, sometimes on the patient's insurance. I hate to say that, but sometimes that is the reality. Um, if you order high-resolution chromo high chromosomes, which we used to do a lot in the past, you will not pick it up. It is too small a deletion, so you cannot do just a chromosome study. But if fish testing will identify up to 95% of affected children. Um, the deletion uh, from the A to the D segment that I mentioned is the most common, and that will identify up to 85% of patients, but about 15% will have smaller uh, deletions. Still, most of them you will pick up uh, on fish. But about 5% um, of patients might be missed because they have a smaller nested deletion that we'd see only on chromosome microarray. 
So I would say that if you um, have the ability, we now tend to do chromosome microarray or CMA as our test of choice. Um, sometimes, as I said, the, our health plans will not cover that without authorization. But fish tests you can routinely get without any preauthorization for all health plans. Um, so that's a good screening test. But if you're seeing a child with some features of 22Q and some developmental delay, you're not quite sure for, that it is 22Q, the best test for those children would be the microarray. Um, and that looks at, as a fish panel across all 46 chromosomes and will allow you to pick up things that look like 22Q. So how is it inherited? Uh, it's a, what we consider an autosomal dominant condition because we have two copies of chromosome 22. And as I mentioned, most of the time it's not familial. About 10% of the time one of the parents would have it. But I'd urge you um, to, to look for very mild features in parents. Um, and if a person is affected, so our patients have a 50% chance of passing it on to their children. Um, and we can't really tell the parents their own risk. So it is appropriate to offer testing to your patient's parents. Uh, and one of the, the key uh, stumbling blocks has been that phenotypic expression, as I said, is quite variable even with the same, in the same family. So one family member may have a heart defect, the other may not, and just have a cleft palate. Uh, so, so that's something that we're actually quite interested in here at PCH. We're starting a genome study, hopefully very soon, where we want to look uh, at our uh, families with multiple affected members. We have about 12 at, uh, or more families right now where we have an affected parent and one or more affected uh, child, and so we want to look at their whole exome, which is the coding part of the genome, to see if we can figure out what is causing this phenotypic variability. As I said, the size of the deletion remains the same, and yet we see this broad spectrum of clinical findings. So there must be other what we call modifier genes involved that are affecting that phenotype in the family. So our goal in our study will be to identify some of these modifier genes. Um, just briefly, I've listed in your um, handout a couple of the, the genes involved. As I said, there's 40 to 60 genes in the region. I'm not going to go into them in detail. Um, many of them we don't know the function of uh, entirely, but a couple that are well characterized are the TBX1 gene in particular. Um, this is a transcription factor gene that we see is involved in multiple developmental processes. It seems to be implicated in causing the craniofacial anomalies as well as the cardiac defects thymic hypoplasia, VPI, so many different uh, problems with that. And a second gene that's been implicated in um, susceptibility to mental illness is the COMT gene, which codes for catecholomethyltransferase involved in cat pardon me, catecholamine degradation. So this has been implicated in causing schizophrenia and some of the OCD symptoms that we're seeing. Uh, and I want to mention microRNA genes. There's many of them in the region. These are genes that code only for RNA but not for protein, and they are now found to be widely expressed in the genome as transcriptional suppressors of other genes in the genome. So uh, one of those has been implicated in, in brain function in 22Q. I would be remiss if I didn't just mention briefly, what if it's not 22Q? What else is in your differential? Um, and I've listed some here, but there are many other syndromes that I didn't think of initially, but CHARGE syndrome is one. Uh, that you've heard of, I'm sure. And a couple of distinguishing features for CHARGE syndrome are, number one, ocular colobomas. So this is a picture of an iris coloboma that's typical and classic for CHARGE syndrome. They also have coanal atresia, which we don't see in 22Q. They do have cardiac anomalies, renal anomalies, growth deficiency, developmental delay. Um, these two little cuties here have CHARGE syndrome. So you can see they have some facial asymmetry, which is very classic for CHARGE syndrome. Um, 22Q duplication syndrome I mentioned. Again, that's a much milder condition that's often missed and may not have any anomalies with it. Um, this little girl has what we call golden heart syndrome or hemifacial microsomia. Um, they also can have cardiac vertebral renal anomalies, C-spine anomalies, but they typically have a lot of asymmetry. You see this little girl has hemifacial microsomia of the mandible, the, the facial bones. They typically have microtia, which we don't see in 22Q, and ear tags are much more common. Um, Vactoral and diabetic embryopathy are two common conditions that are not uh, genetic uh, in origin. Um, I think the distinguishing feature in Vodder or Vactoral are the, is the TE fistula and anal atresia, so we don't see those typically in 22Q. Unfortunately, with the, the rise of diabetes, we are seeing more and more babies born uh, to moms, uh, diabetic mothers, and 
we are seeing a much more severe spectrum of uh, anomalies in those babies, typically midline anomalies, sometimes severe heart defects, and I check those babies for 22Q as well. Uh, they may also have vertebral and renal anomalies and even ear anomalies. And again, uh, quite a host of other chromosome and genetic disorders that I'm not going to list here. So I just want to end my talk for a few minutes saying, what is the appropriate management for patients with 22Q? Well, like many complex disorders, you know, it really is imperative that we manage our patients with the multidisciplinary team approach. This is just the best care we can provide to our patients. Um, and to facil facilitate a more coordinated approach, um, Hobble et al. published this article in 2015 creating some guidelines that we use uh, for medical management of 22Q. And I, I think this diagram from his article just really beautifully illustrates the specialists that a child with 22Q may need and at which time in life they're most critical. Um, so I think you can recognize right away in the newborn period this big blip here for cardiology. So that's um, the most life-threatening medical issue. Many of them need one or more heart surgeries in the newborn period. Often then they uh, you know, do well, they're stabilized, and sometimes they may need a second surgery at seven years of age, and sometimes even in their 20s for a pulmonary or artery or aortic valve replacement. But again, they need cardiac follow-up throughout life. Uh, likewise, feeding issues I mentioned are a big component of life and, and speech and feeding both in the first three years of life. Um, and then palate surgery sometimes occurs a little bit later. So velopharyngeal insufficiency, sometimes we don't diagnose till they're talking uh, and speaking more and they undergo a procedure called a nasoendoscopy. So that becomes more of an issue closer to school age. They might have a surgery here and then may need some speech and language follow up throughout life. Later on it becomes more social language. And as you can see, behavior and learning become more of a component later in life and psychiatric issues um, in adulthood. Immunology needs to be followed throughout life and endocrine as well. These are things that we do on an annual basis. So our patients don't need just one eval, they really need to come back for checkups and comprehensive evals every one to two years. And then of course they put genetics here at the end. I'd like to think that we're present throughout life, but certainly uh, when the children are teenagers, we, we want to give them appropriate genetic counseling for their recurrence risks. So um, with our advances in uh, cardiology care, um, you know, we have a lot of teens and adults that we follow too. These are some of the team members you can read about and, and we're very fortunate to have all these specialties on our team. These are some of the tests that we typically do. I've really mentioned most of them already. Some of them are done at the time of diagnosis and if they're normal, we don't need to repeat them like the renal ultrasound. But other of the blood studies I do once a year to monitor since things now we know can fluctuate with time. With all the great advances in our uh, pediatric cardiology care and cardiothoracic surgery care, our patients are growing up. And now we have this need for a new specialty, adult congenital heart care. Um, and again, we're very lucky to have Tabitha Moe here in our department. She's on my team. She sees our young adults with 22Q. Um, and I have to say she's diagnosed many, maybe up to five or six young adults with 22Q who had heart surgery as children but were never diagnosed. Um, so again, we now have guidelines. I just put this here to show you kind of some guidelines that are being developed to monitor and treat our adults. So wrapping up, I just uh, want to uh, review like whom should you consider to test for 22Q? And hopefully with uh, this information, you have some ideas of different types of problems that would make you think of 22Q. So definitely the child with congenital heart defects of, of all types, but mainly the outflow tract anomalies the patient with the cleft palate, the feeding issues, and hypernasality. And I would say that if you have a child, a newborn with feeding issues that seem at all out of the range of the norm, have a high suspicion because testing early is really the key to getting them the, the appropriate treatment, feeding therapy, and speech therapy that really uh, improves their outcome. But any child with nonspecific developmental delay merits a genetic workup, a child with unexplained hypocalcemia, and then uh, older children, teens and adults with psychiatric disorders, especially schizophrenia. Um, we do have our wonderful clinic here. Just to mention at the end, and I have in your handout our contact information. We started our clinic uh, with my colleagues Devinder Singh and Steve Pofal back in 2014. We're now in our fourth year. We have over 170 patients, including over 20 to 30 adults and teens, um, some families. 
and uh, we're held on the fourth Monday of the month. I put here our contact information. You can call us. We have a page on the PCH website. Uh, Vanessa Stoll, who's here, is our clinic coordinator. You can call Vanessa. Um, so we're really happy to see any of your patients. If it's a patient that you think might have 22Q but you haven't diagnosed them, we're happy to see them in our general genetics clinic as well. This is our great team. I'm so proud of them. They really, we really um, work together uh, great and have, just have a good time, but also really I think are impacting the health and lives of our patients. Um, and we have a virtual team as well that's really equally important. Dwayne Wong comes um, to our meetings, doesn't see the patients, but reviews all the T-cell studies for me, and Dorothea Newburn from Endocrine uh, reviews all of our um, endocrine studies, and then as needed, I refer patients out to them. Uh, this is our team. We, the patients come for a full day, so they're here from 7.30 in the morning till about 3.30 in the afternoon. It's a long day. And, and then we meet here for our post-clinic conference, which I think is really essential, because that allows us to discuss and go back and forth and develop really a unique uh, medical plan for each patient. Uh, and then following that, we uh, put together a team report, which we send to the PCP, the cardiologist, and, and other providers. We don't take the place of the patient's providers. If they need any testing, follow-up, imaging, referrals, I take care of all that. Uh, just finally, some support for our families in the community. We have a wonderful Facebook uh, support group in Arizona. That's how they reach them um, for adults and teens. And I wanted to mention the 22Q Family Foundation. This is a national organization uh, that has a lot of help for families and for patients who are struggling with education and learning support. They have uh, this website called the Education Station Consulting. It's free. Your patients can go there and talk via Skype with Donna Cutler Landsman, who's an education specialist. We're lucky to have her speak here. She will review the child's IEP and make suggestions for free. So that's a great resource. And then a couple of other groups. This is our speech camp we've done for three years for our kids, a free camp over at the Barrow Cleft and Craniofacial Center where they um, spend a week doing arts and crafts and learning social language and talking and uh, just having fun. And that's supported uh, by our uh, foundation and our, our grant money. So we've been very lucky to have that as well. Okay, now comes question time. Um, Matt, can you help me with the, the mock question? So I have one question for you, hopefully to reinforce what we talked about today. Um, which of the following is not a cardinal feature or a cardinal presenting sign of 22Q? I guess if you want to vote on that, if you tell me if I passed or failed. <coughs> yeah, 100%, good job, that's, that's correct, yes. Yeah, so T. E. Fischler, I, I could have made a harder question. T. E. Fischl is more of a presenting sign with that Potter syndrome and not with 22Q. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your time.